Have you seen Enya today? Good morning, everybody. Has anyone seen Enya? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Welcome to Abundant Life. My name is Sean. I'm the music pastor here at Abundant Life. Welcome to those of you who are online. It's good to see you, at least virtually. Um, come on inside if you can hear my voice. We would love to worship with you. It's an opportunity today. We've got a great service planned, an opportunity to give God praise, to thank Him for all He's done, to hear what He's doing across this nation or this world globally. Our God is bigger than anything we can possibly imagine. So we get a chance today to respond to that. So I just want to invite you in, um, to come in. And, and, and once you get yourself settled, if you'd stand with me, we're going to worship the Lord together in, in, in song, in His Word, in celebration, um, in giving, and, and in community. See, there's a reason why we all come here, and there's a reason why we all want to be together, is that this life of being a Christian is meant to be done in community, in the context of community. If we're doing it all on our own, that was never God's intent. That's why the bride is, the church of Christ is so important. There's so many things that each one of us has in our identities of who God made us to be that, that needs to be reflected in the community, that needs to be worked through and, and, and grown and used in the community. So as you're coming, I just want to pray before we continue on. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're in this place, that we have an opportunity right now to forget about the past, to look forward to this day that you've given us, to rejoice and be glad in it. Because, God, you're here. Lord, we don't have to worry as long as we are following your path. And I pray, God, that we would seek you and know what it is, God, that you are speaking to us and how to walk and live. And may you be glorified today. As we respond to you, and it's in Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen, amen. Let's worship our Heavenly Father. We to thank Him for all He's done. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, poor oh, vagabond. And just when I choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so so long to my old friends burning in bitterness you could just keep them moving nah you ain't welcome here oh just now look I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you saved my soul This wayward son has found its way back
lost another one. Come on, let's see it. church. It's great to be with you guys today. I want to welcome our guests and all our lifers here. I'd like to ask you first to fill out a connection card. You can do that one of three ways. The first one is you can take this little card in front of your seat back. You can scan the QR code and fill out the information or you can get the information. It should be on the screen in just a moment. Or if you got a text message link, you can go ahead and click on that and fill that out. I have two announcements for you today. The first one is next Sunday, we have an opportunity to celebrate with Baptism Sunday. So if you have not been baptized, that's a great time to cheer and celebrate. Yeah. So if you have not been baptized yet and you would like to or you want more information, you can contact the church office and we'll get all that information to you. The second announcement today is May 19th through the 20th, we have our men's conference in Sacramento, and this is a call out to all the men, all the young men, the boys, the teenagers, and the men who are not so young. Uh, you are highly encouraged to join this opportunity to come and hear life-changing information and experiences. Jamie Winship is our guest speaker for the entire conference, and he is the guy that's been pivotal influence in our church body uh, with this this past year of transformation and identity. So you don't want to miss out. Registration is still open. So if you need help with getting registered, you can contact the church office and ask how to do that. This is a two-day conference, Friday night and Saturday throughout the day. And I promise you, it will change your life. So come and join us. Let's continue to worship God. Sing that chorus one last time. He picked me up, he turned me around. Oh, he picked me up, he turned me around. He placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Because he healed my heart, he changed my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Hell lost another one, I am free. He is the lion and the lamb, worthy of praise and glory. Let's exalt his name.
broken hearts to clarity's praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow. For the King of Kings, our God who comes to save us is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. Tongue will confess that you are Lord. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Every knee will bow before you, Lord, worthy of praise and glory and honor in this place, high and lifted up, mighty King, glorious in splendor, worthy of praise. See, sometimes we've got to get things right. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. As he, we seek Him, He leads us. That path is straight because we follow Him. Hallelujah. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. 
When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't Cause I still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense So I won't be He won't fail. 
He won't fail. He won't fail. No, He won't. Hallelujah. easy for us to sing these songs and we'll sing them in most cases they're fun they're a reminder but God when times get tough sometimes we struggle God I know you're beckoning us to seek you to spend time with you There's a reason Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven and that the experience of it is like searching for hidden treasure, something you've lost. And maybe the best, you know, years ago used to be car keys, but now it's probably your phone. When that's lost, there, there's a feeling of worry. Everything that's on my phone what am I going to do about it? Well, everything stops at that moment, right? When we go and look and we search and we, oh, goodness, there it is. You see, that's how it's meant to be when we haven't spent time with the Lord, when we haven't sought Him. And it's not meant to be this ritual that's, oh, boy. He wants to speak to you in the midst of your time. And when he does, your day has been set by the Lord. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. He's told you, this is what I'd like you to do. See, the moment we have shame, guilt, fear, worry, anger, warning, warning, Take it to the Lord. Follow Jesus' example. He got up early. And I know for a lot of us, this is a good routine we're into, and praise the Lord for it. For some of us, it's a struggle. And it will be. It will be. Because, see, Satan's going to want to pull any connection you have from the Lord away by distracting you with what he can. It's, but there's nothing he can do about it unless we accept it. So I just want to invite you in this moment. There is nothing else that's more important. There is nothing else that should take the place of our worship to our God. Let us seek Him. Come. 
just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just say another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Well, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you, you don't owe me, me anything. More than anything that you can do, I just want you. beauty of this relationship with the Lord is that he's not asking us to do something he hasn't done himself. See, he took that first step. He's always ready and willing, and I, and I would imagine excited to spend time with us, to seek him as we seek him. Because any father who sees his son or daughter want to spend time with him, that means the world the world and he sees us go and, and doing all these things and some of them were, could be really good but oftentimes we do them for the wrong motives we haven't been led by the Lord in doing so sometimes we have and that's great but that's when the burdens come and the weights are heavy and Jesus is saying I didn't give that to you though Seek me. Spend time with me. Allow yourself to be filled with my presence. And it's so hard because a lot of us live in a mind that's logical and, and, and certain, and we see there's no way, but if I don't do this and this and this, I'm in trouble. That's when Jesus reminds us, do, do you recall the miracles I've done? Oh, and by the way, I've created this universe, so there's that too. There's nothing he can't do. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, that you sought us first. You died for us and you loved us, even though we were still sinners. Separated from you. We thank you, God. You took the first step, and I pray right now that there'd be nothing else that would get in the way of our time with you, of sensing your presence each day. God, we rejoice in your name. You are the lion and the lamb. You are our firm foundation. May you be glorified and celebrated today, this day, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. If you give the Lord praise this morning. Amen, amen. Peter, I want to bring you up. We get to hear a word of the Lord this morning through Peter. Good morning, church family. Here's a reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Let's continue to cherish the house of the Lord. Good morning, Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the provision you've given us this week. 
We had the opportunity to go to work this week, most of us. And when we did, we received money in return. And we know that that's all because of you. You gave us the mind, you gave us the body, you gave us the time, you've given us the opportunity. And because of that, we can return in thanks and say, God, we love you and we want to satisfy the longing of your heart. And that is that more and more people, like we've heard about today, can come to know you as their Savior. And that the population of heaven will grow. And as we sang this morning, hell will lose another one. So we give you praise today for our giving. And thank you for all your provision in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right, let's get into the word today. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. We're, for those that are guests with us or you haven't been with us in a while, and for those maybe that are tuning in online for the first time, our theme for this year is go deeper. Go deeper. What does that mean, go deeper? Well, we've understood that go deeper biblically means to become whole. That the Bible says that God's mission is to transform us into the likeness of Jesus. That's the journey that we're on. That when we accept Christ as our Savior, that, that the goal is not just to stay that way and become a new, improved model, no, but to be completely transformed so that our thinking, our decisions, our heart's desires, uh, our purposes, our goals, all become in alignment with Jesus's. And that our very nature is transformed into his likeness. When that happens, we experience wholeness. That life without Jesus, as we heard even the testimonies today, that there is lack of joy, there is lack of peace, there is lack of understanding. And when the gospel is preached to someone, that there is that, that newness, that fullness, that joy that comes into their life. Because that's who Jesus is. He's not a religion. He's not some kind of uh, you know, self-help program. He's our creator. And our creator designed us not only to know him, but to be like him. And that's what God's task has been. Now, we learned last week as we started this new series, God's Pathway to Wholeness, that Jesus laid out a whole set of guidelines in the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, the first part being this portion that we call the Beatitudes. And I'll explain what that word means in just a moment. But there are eight statements that we learn that build upon one another, that create a pathway to this wholeness. Last week we learned about the very first step, and it's a strange first step. We're often looking for, you know, give me the new you know, way to achieve. Give me the new way to success. Give me the new way to purpose. And the very first step that Jesus taught was, the first step is to be poor in spirit. That doesn't sound like a successful model to me. That sounds completely the opposite of what a successful, successful world model would be. In this world, it's go get them. Step on who you have to. Get out there and work really hard. Get out there and strive. And Jesus says just the opposite. He says, when you become poor in spirit, when you realize you can't and that God can, that's the first step realizing you're helpless to be righteous as he is righteous, realizing that you have no hope in your own strength to be righteous and for God to welcome you into his kingdom. It's a fascinating thought that really the way to get into God's kingdom is to realize you can't get into God's kingdom. And then in that helpless state, you cry out to God and say, God, what am I supposed to do? And, G and God says, look to my son. And when we look to his son, we find the door open. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. Well, that first step is followed up by a second step. And that's what we're studying today in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, where the scripture says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Say that with me. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, first, let's remember what the word blessed means. Blessed means joy untouchable. That's what I mean, not happy. Some translators want to say this means happy. Happy is determined by the circumstances. You're happy one day, you're sad the next day. And how many know Christians can be happy one day and sad the next day? 
It's just the reality of life. Not everything is going to make you happy. Christians don't have to be happy all the time. Sad times occur, grievous times occur, hurts occur, pains occur, difficulties occur. We don't have to put on this phony Christian mask that will somehow authenticate that God is good and that we have to pretend hard times don't bother us. How many would agree hard times bother us? It's just the truth. We grieve, we struggle, but you see, joy is deeper. Joy is an untouchable reality that even in the hardest times, God never fails. He is always present. He is always with us. He will always see us through. That's who he is, and that you can't touch because you can't overcome God's love. You can't overcome his power. You can't overcome his blessing. So blessed are those that those who mourn have this joy untouchable in their lives. Now that seems backwards. It seems crazy. How could mourning do that? Well, let's find out what mourning means. What did he mean by that? Mourning is a response to something grievous. We mourn probably most commonly when someone in our life has passed away and we grieve. We miss them and it hurts. Maybe we grieve the loss of a job. Maybe we grieve uh, some kind of circumstance that was really bad, a disaster, something like that. We grieve those things. Well, in this context, Jesus isn't talking about just grieving over a circumstance or, the, or a loss. He's talking about grieving over, what was our first beatitude? Blessed are what? The poor in spirit. This follows that. He's saying you're mourning over the state that you are in, that you're poor in spirit. God, I've got nothing, and I'm mourning over that. What what happened to me? What happened to my life that left me in this situation where I've got no way to get to you? What am I supposed to do to get to you? We realize that it was our sin. No different than Adam's original sin in the garden, for we've all sinned and fallen short. No different than that. We don't have any excuse to say, well, they did that. I would have never done that. Oh, yeah, you would have, because we did. That we're mourning over that which left us poor in spirit. We're mourning over the destruction that we've caused ourselves. We're mourning over the destruction we've caused others. We're mourning not over, you know, global warming or the lack of world peace and, you know, those things are worth some grief, I suppose, but we're mourning over the fact that our sin put Jesus on the cross. That's what we're grieving. And you know what? God wants us there. Because, you see, unless we mourn over that, then we really haven't become poor in spirit. When we're truly poor in spirit, we, our eyes are open. We go, that's what I did? That's what I caused? That's my spiritual state? And we grieve. If we never grieve, we don't know that that's our spiritual state. You following me? They work together. So, if we're not grieved over that spiritual emptiness, then we really can't mourn. But if we are grieved, or rather we do understand that we're poor in spirit, and we feel that mourning, and somehow there's this thought in your mind that says, well, I shouldn't feel so bad. Well, I shouldn't have this you know, down feeling, or not down, but I shouldn't have this grievous feeling. No, no, no. Jesus says, you're blessed when you have that. You're blessed when you realize the severity of your lost state. Because if you don't realize the severity, you'll never cry out for help. If you never realize how sick you are, you'll never go to the doctor. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. And there were those who didn't realize they were sick and they despised him. They even called out for him to be crucified. Where those who realized they needed a doctor embraced him because they knew he was their only hope. 
What does this look like in real life? You have to turn to Psalm 51. You keep your finger in Matthew 5, but turn to Psalm 51, where we have this, this powerful morning prayer that King David prayed in the Bible. Now, before we get to the prayer itself, we need to understand why David prayed it. Many of you are familiar with the story. Some of you may not be, so I'll describe it for you briefly, that David is the king. David is not only the king of Israel, he is the anointed, chosen king of Israel, the most successful king of Israel, the king of Israel that has brought the nation of Israel from obscurity and judgment by other nations into basically the regional powerhouse. David is the champion. He's the one who defeated Goliath. He's the one who has led battles uh, and, and, and overcome all the enemies. David is the people's champion. He's the king they've, they've longed for. Well, sometimes even the best kings get tired or they get lazy or both. It's not usually in a time of struggle when you stop seeking for God. It's in a time of comfort when you stop seeking for God. And David got comfortable. And it says in 2 Samuel that in a time when kings usually go off to war, David stayed home. Now, in the past, he'd gone off to war. He's the, he's the, he's the fighter. If you want to fight, you want David there. And this time, David says, guys, been there, done that. I'm a little tired, getting a little older, fought the fights. You guys got it. I mean, we've had successes. Go handle it. And I'll just hang here. When we start to lose our edge, we ought to beware. And David, at a moment, a lapse of judgment where he was feeling the loss of his edge. And one night it said that he woke up, got out of his bed, and went up onto the, to the roof of the palace. And as he went up on the roof, he happened to look down. And in the evening was a beautiful woman. And she was bathing. And he was attracted to her. He didn't know her. So he sent his, his palace uh, servants to go down and to find out who she was. First step of, of compromise. Maybe I won't do anything. I just want to know a little bit. I just want to, just want to find out. Well, what David found out was that she was the wife of one of his great champions. Later in 2 Samuel, we find out that this woman's name, whose, whose name was Bathsheba, had a husband named Uriah. Uriah was one of David's greatest fighters. It says that once he found out about her and who she was, he contemplated. He thought it through. It wasn't just like a whim. And he said, go get her for me. He, was, he lost his edge. He didn't go and do what he was supposed to do. In that inactivity, in that, in that lack of pursuing what was right, he got tempted, and then he gave in to his temptation, and he took her. He slept with her, and he got her pregnant. Uriah's out on the battlefield. Uriah's fighting. Her husband that he's sleeping with is fighting for him, giving his life, putting his life on the line for the king and for the nation, while he's sleeping with his wife. He gets her pregnant. Bathsheba lets him know. And it comes time for the baby to be born. Nine months of cover-up. This wasn't just some, you know, boom, boom thing. That, that Uriah's out fighting, and they kept it secret. Bathsheba, of course, no doubt, the Bible doesn't tell us, but no doubt not to just crush her husband, but to avoid humiliation. David, no doubt, needs to keep his reputation as a holy man, a mighty man, a godly man. So the deception gets deeper. When she's about ready, well, when she's in the process of, of her pregnancy, he calls Uriah back home, tries to get him to sleep with her by praising him. You're a good man, Uriah. You're a fighter. Wanted to hear what's going out in the field. Why don't you go home and sleep with your wife? Uriah was having none of it. How could I sleep with her when my men are out risking their life? And he wouldn't do it. So David decided to get him drunk. Maybe if he gets drunk, he'll lose his senses and he'll sleep with her. Even in an inebriated state, Uriah said, no, I'm not going to do that. 
So David couldn't even manipulate the situation until he saw no hope. And he sends Uriah back out into the fight. And he tells his general, Joab, says, Joab, put him in the hottest, most fiercest place of battle. And then pull away from him. Don't watch his back. What a horrible thing to do. Let the enemy kill him. And that's what happened. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. God spoke to the prophet Nathan. And Nathan came to David one day and told him a story. He said, King, what would you think if you heard about a man who was rich? And this man had dozens and dozens and dozens of lambs. And when a traveler came through, the man was obligated to serve him a feast, serve him a meal. And so he went to find a lamb to slaughter, to serve this man the meal. But when he, went out, when he went out to find the lamb, instead of going to his own huge flock, there was a neighbor, and that man was poor. That man didn't have flocks. That man had one lamb. And that lamb was like a child to him. That lamb drank from his cup and, 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 and was, was, was so dear. And the man, instead of taking one of his many, took that one man's lone. He took that man's lone lamb, took it and killed it. Nathan the prophet said, what would you do, king, if you heard of that situation? And the king was furious. He said, that man ought to die. And Nathan looked, and in the front of all the palace servants says, David, you are that man. You're the one. You took a man's only, you took a man's wife. You could have had any woman you wanted. You're the king. And instead of taking from all the women that you could have in your kingdom, you took the one man's wife? That's the story where we find David in his mourning in Psalm 51. Here's what David says in part. For I know the transgressions, or I know my transgressions, and I know my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. David wrote many other things which we'll get to in just a moment. So look at his words. If I could work this off, God, I'd do it. If there was a way for you to say, okay, just do these things here, follow these you know, religious guidelines, say this many prayers, give this much in the offering, make these sacrifices, then everything will be good. He says, if there was a way to do that, I'd do it. But he says, you don't delight in sacrifice. If you did, I'd bring it. He says, what you want is a broken spirit. What you want is mourning, a grief over what you did, a broken heart. Now, some people don't like this passage because they say, whoa, 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 hold on. It says, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. What about Bathsheba? What about Uriah? What about their parents? What about the baby who, who uh, died as a result? There's lots of carnage that goes around here. The issue is, is that none of those are the lawmaker. Bathsheba didn't originate the law. Uriah didn't originate the law. God did. God, first violation is against his Lord. And yes, the fallout damages many, many, many people. So in your bullets, mourning is the essential heart attitude you must experience before you can realize the joy of the Christian life. If you don't truly know you need God, you'll never have the joy when he's presented to you. That's why as, as our guest was talking today about the stories, when someone's been without God and they finally meet him, there's great joy. But when it's like, oh, yeah, I've been there, seen there, done that. Yeah, I've been to church before, no big deal. Then there's no joy. 
and someone really knows the position they're in. If we never come to grips with the severity of our sin, we'll never experience the joy. That's why mourning is blessed. Blessed are you when you realize the severity. If you don't realize the severity, the joy doesn't follow, neither does the comfort. But they will be comforted, the Scripture says. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Here's what David writes, and these are five things that provided him comfort. Let me walk you through these. These are things we need to know today. Number one, we trust the truth of God's mercy and compassion. Here's what David said in Psalm 51, 1 to 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is honest confession. Step number one of of the blessing of mourning that leads to comfort is to tell the truth about where you are and trust God's mercy and compassion? When you tell the truth, he's going to have mercy and compassion. you got to trust that. you got to bring it to God. Say, God, this is what I did. This is what I was thinking. This was my motive. Some of us are afraid. We're afraid to go to God honestly. We're afraid, you know, the lightning bolt is going to come. The big hammer, the anger, the wrath of God is going to come. No, no, the wrath of God was appeased. We celebrated it two weeks ago on Easter Sunday. The wrath of God is not awaiting you when you're honest before him. That wrath was placed on Jesus on the cross. You won't receive wrath. You'll receive comfort and mercy. For blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It isn't, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, David just owned it. Now, it took him a while to own it. It took him the confrontation with a prophet to own it. But he owned it. He said, God, I did it. I did it. I took someone who wasn't mine. I committed adultery. I lied about it. And I had a man killed to cover my own lies, to cover my own reputation. I even involved other people in the manipulation. I did all of that, and I'm grieving over it. It says, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I love that trust. David is falling on the mercy of his God Saying, God, I did it. Have mercy on me. That's number one. If we don't start there, we get nowhere else. If we don't start right there and say, I am poor in spirit. I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of. I know that without God, I will over and over and over resist him and rebel against him. I know my weakness. I know my frailty. I know my mind. I know my tendencies. I will. And if we, if, if, if we are not in that place right now, then we got to really go back to step one and realize that we're poor in spirit. I know this about me. Without God, I will do vile things. Without the word of God, I will lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, use, because that's my nature without God. But with God, I have a new nature. I've been transformed into somebody different. So have mercy on me, O God, when we own it. Number two, God can show mercy to an honest confession. Here's what he says. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He's confident that God will do what he promised. We don't go to God with God, I did it, and I sure hope maybe sort of, kind of, if you will, if you got any, you know, a little inkling of mercy for me. No, David is bold and said, if you wash me, I'll be washed. If you cleanse me, I'll be cleansed. There is absolute faith that when he calls on his God, he'll receive. And that's what we need today. We need a confidence. The enemy, or the lie of the enemy is that you've got to beg him, plead before him, Uh, uh, as David prayed in the first verse, God, if you wanted sacrifice, I would have given it. We think, God, can can I do more for you? Can I serve more? 
That's all religious nonsense. It's lies. He doesn't demand your sacrifice. He asks for a broken and contrite spirit. And when you come to him, here's what the faith to believe is. It's the faith to believe that when you confess, he is faithful and just and will forgive you. He will. Right now. No, right now. How many of you have ever come into church guilty? You walked in these doors, and the reason you walked in the doors, because maybe you had a particularly bad week when it came to your own righteousness, and you know like, oh, God, God's got to be ticked now. I better get to church and get things right. And you walk in, and there's a heaviness on you. There's a little bit of guilt. The songs are playing, and you can't really sing them with a lot of vigor and a lot of exuberance because you know it's kind of hypocritical if you do because of what you've just been through. And now you come before him like, oh, God, how could he even accept me right now? And you go through all of that just falseness. You know how I know that that's reality? Because I've done that. But now add on the, the pressure of when I've come into the sanctuary like that, I have to get up and teach you this stuff. How is that going to work? And see, here's the faith to believe. No, God, I trust your work on the cross. I trust that when you say you are faithful and just and will forgive, it's not you will forgive after I pay my dues, after I pay my penance, after I've punished myself. No, punishment is, for the, is, is, is of the enemy. That's all lies. Jesus said, or God said in the garden, Adam, Eve, come out. Let me cover you. God immediately restores you. The only thing that keeps us from being restored is us. And there has to be the faith that says, yes, I was awful last week or yesterday or this morning. And God, I own that. Now, Lord, I'm coming to you mourning. And I accept your complete forgiveness so that we can enter in with joy and there doesn't have to be the self-beating. Jesus already took the beating. It's done. Number three, ask for a change of heart and a right spirit. David said, verse 10 and 11, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right or steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Here's David's cry. I own it. I know you'll forgive me, but I know my heart and I need a new one. I know me, and I know what I'll do. And here's what I often pray. God, I don't have the power to change, and to be honest with you, Lord, I don't even want to change sometimes. Anybody else been there? That because the sin, the stuff, it comes accompanied with some pleasure, or else it wouldn't be tempting. The reason it's tempting is because it has a little bit of something for you. And we want to attach, we want that part of it. And so that little bit that's something for us, we still crave and we still want it. And so I go to God sometimes, I go, God, right now, to be honest, I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. I want to resist you right now. God, would you give me the want to want to? We even need that. Give me the want to want your right. Give me the want to want to do the right thing. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit. As we pray that, as we go to him with that, God's Holy Spirit does the transforming work. That's what he does. That's his work, not ours. And then we find that we can start to understand our purpose. When in the lives of the enemy and sin, our purpose is clouded. We don't even know what we're supposed to do. We're just running around trying to get help. But once we've received from the Lord his cleansing, once he starts to work that clean heart, that new heart in us, then we start understanding his purposes. We start to want what he wants. We start to do what he wants us to do. And there we find the joy of the Lord in doing what he's called us to do. We truly, as so many people have said since way back 
in the 60s, I need to find myself. When you find out who you really are, you mourn before the Lord, he cleanses you, you receive his cleansing, and you ask him for that new heart, you actually find yourself, but not in you, in him. You find your meaning. You find the reason you were created. Because he's your creator. You find that joy again. And number four, he'll restore that. When you find that purpose, your joy is restored. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that the sinners will turn back to you. The joy of the Lord fills your life. And then it doesn't become a burden to do the things God wants you to do. You do it in joy. I love the fact that the boaters are with us and you can sense the joy in the testimony, right? Can't get back there. Can't wait to get back there. It's a joy to go to a place that is so difficult and that is so, uh, you know, not aware of God. It's joyful. Because when you've received from Him, As a result of your mourning, and God has filled you, he's cleansed you, he's creating a clean heart, he restores the joy of your salvation, and now the purpose of why you should live is yours. That's wholeness, church. That's wholeness. And number five, that's why we praise him. My tongue will sing of your your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. If you're a guest with us and you wonder, what is with these people? They're kind of rambunctious when they do that singing time. There's a reason why we praise. Many churches like us praise the way we do. You know why? Because blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Because we realize what it's like to live life without Jesus. We realize what it's like to have no purpose, to have no meaning to be broken, to be unwhole, to be confused, to lack joy, to lack peace, to be caught in the bondage of of lusts and wants and covetousness and desires and envies and jealousies and hatreds and angers and all those things and just to be just, ah! We don't know what to do and we mourn and we cry out to God and God says, I'm going to comfort you and I'm going to release you and I'm going to give you freedom. Because that's what Jesus does, and that's what he did on the cross, and that's what he does today. And when he does that, he begins to restore, and he begins to to pour in because of your honest confession. And he creates a clean heart. He restores the joy of your salvation. He gives you a new purpose. And the juxtaposition of those two lives is something that we just can't stop praising God for. We can't not. How could you just go, oh, hum, yeah, fine. When you know where you've come from and you know where you are, there's no way to stop. That's why. That's why. Jesus said, those who have been forgiven much, love much. And that doesn't mean, oh, the ones who really, really did bad things like David. Well, I didn't do bad things like that. I never committed adultery. I never killed anybody. So, no. No, it's all of us knowing where we've all been apart from God. That's what starts this whole thing in process. We realize we're poor in spirit and we mourn over it and there comes the comfort. If we were to write this in a different way, we might say, better to weep now and laugh for eternity than laugh now and weep forever. It's better to feel the weight of our condition and fall on God's mercy and receive his comfort than to try to explain it away or to say it's not so bad. It is that bad. Jesus died. That's how bad it is. And today I'm just grateful that I don't have to wallow in the morning any longer. I can rest in his comfort and receive the joy of the Lord, the joy of my salvation, experience His wonderful presence, to live in meaning and purpose, 
and to praise him every day for it because I know it's got nothing to do with me and everything to do with him. So let's linger on that this morning. If you're a guest with us or even if you're online, we do this every Sunday because we don't think it's a really good idea to hear things like this and then just walk out and go, okay, fine, let's go back to life. We think it's really important to think about it, to pray it over, to talk to God about it. So in the next few moments, or as long as you really want to take, you can stay here and you can pray where you're seated. You can get separate from people. Sometimes folks like to come up where it's separate and pray up in front. You can do whatever you want to do. But let's think about what we've heard. And here are four thoughts that you can think about. Do you trust his mercy and compassion enough to be honest with him? David said, I'm going to own this. And God, I know if you wash me, I'll be clean. Do we trust him enough and have faith enough that God is not interested in pounding you into submission? He's interested in rescuing you to a new place of joy. So are you willing to be honest? Number two, are you willing to ask for a change of heart and mind? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit. And even if it means you have to ask for the want to want to, that's okay. Start there. Number three, are you willing to receive God's comfort and joy? Some of us have a hard time receiving because we think we have to beat ourselves up to pay a price. A price that Jesus already paid. Are you willing to receive that by faith and say, God, I know I don't deserve it, but I receive it. And I will joyfully accept your gift. And then number four, will you praise him for your restored purpose? That's our work today. And the work is to believe. And then God does the transformation. Let's take time as Pastor Sean leads us, or rather just provide some background music. But take some time to pray. When you feel you're done talking to the Lord, you're free to get up and go. Um, others want to stay longer, feel free. There'll be some elders in each corner of the sanctuary if you have personal or, or particular needs that you'd like to ask prayer for. Feel free to get up from where you are and go pray with one of them. But let's not leave this place without the comfort of the Lord. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you lead us now. I've done enough talking. What we want, God, is for you to talk to us. I ask you, Lord, to open our minds and hearts to talk to us right now as we linger in your presence. In Jesus' name.
just want you Heavenly Father I pray God you continue to speak into our lives Lord that we would diligently seek you knowing God that you are life we cannot handle this existence on our own God pray that you would receive our truth, our confessions to you as we tell you the truth about how we feel, understanding, God, that we've come a place, from a place of wretchedness, but you call us not to live there. We thank you for your mercy, can receive your joy. We do so today, Lord, I pray that you be glorified in our lives. And as we go from this place, God, may others see and receive that life because the truth will set us free. We thank you for your truth. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.